the man of the hour. It's that's what I'm dubbing former Senator uh, Simon Sanchez, and that's the the capacity in which we are speaking with him today. Half a day, sir. Well, I'm a used to be. <laughs> no, there's no. Of, there's a lot of us used to be. Well, you're you're also a current Lee, bef- lest we forget. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and by the way, I, I love that song you were playing, and I like golf. So. Oh, okay, okay. Well, since so. since we're in such a uh, amicable mood, uh, can... <laughs> I, I, I hear I'm being dragged into a, co- a conversation for a law that I helped author way back, 16, 18 years ago. Yeah, in fact, I, I am in receipt of uh, of the signing letter from Carl Gutierrez, then governor, a uh, used to be governor of Guam. Mm-hmm. Uh, at January trying, trying to be governor of <laughs> January 19th so you guys in in the uh w- was it the uh 27th Guam legislature acted 25th. uh 25th, 25th Guam legislature acted pretty fast on this well i've been working on it you know from the time i think that's the second year of the term i've been working on it the bill uh you know back back in that day and then still to this day you know the prompt payment act was we modeled that after legislation in the US uh, it's, not, it's not, you know, something brand new that no one had ever heard of even back then. Uh, and it was, it was, it was really kind of a trend to make sure that if, if a service was provided by a by, by a provider, a hospital, a doctor, uh, a healthcare provider, that they get that bill out quickly. And, and and the compromise was, if you get the bill out quickly, then the insurance company, the payer, has to then also work quickly so we can get these claims paid. And the idea that if the service gets rendered. You want to bill it quickly, and you want those that can pay for the bill to pay it quickly, and that's the prompt payment concept, right? So that yeah. that was the goal. Uh, uh, Governor Gutierrez, in his signing letter, says that the the law provides that if a health care provider does not submit a claim for payment within 90 days from the date health services were rendered, quote, there is no obligation for either the health care payer or the patient. To pay, end quote, and I think that is the premise of what is being touted in a full-page ad in both of our daily newspapers from Take Care, and the interpretation uh, that some of the bills uh, that GRMC is is has sent out are null and void because of that 90-day provision is being disputed by the the medical city, and so I don't know if uh, if because we're rewinding the clock all the way back to 2001, uh, if you can speak, I guess, definitively on who's right and who's wrong here. Well, I mean, you are asking me to think back on legislation that's 17 years ago, but I, I was sent a copy, and, and I would say that I might, um, in, and I don't mean to be disrespectful of Governor Gutierrez, I'm not sure in his cover letter that I would read it that way. Okay. Uh, the, the, the law defines a health plan administrator. To mean insurance companies, health plan providers, all company defined as third-party payers, including but not limited to health maintenance organizations, medical service organizations, government, governmental organizations, workers' comp organizations, but nowhere. So they're talking about health plan administrator because the thing says, if you're a provider and you get a bill to a health plan administrator, then they got to pay. So I, I know one of the contentions between Take Care and uh, GRMC is whether a self-pay. Uh, and in the case of Take Care, if I understand the facts right, Take Care does not have a contract with GRMC. Right. So if you're a Take Care customer, from a GRMC point of view, at least if you go there, you are a you're a self-pay. Right. Um, and I understand that Take Care and GRMC were trying to establish a relationship, but so far that has not occurred. So it's it's left this group of people that have gone to GRMC uh, under, but they're customers of Take Care, but Take Care does not have still does not have a contract with GRMC. Um, it kind of has put them in this gray area, which is what I think the argument is about. But I, I know, I, I believe GRMC is arguing that the law does not ap- apply to individuals; it applies to right. health plan administrators. And and the and so if you go from the definitions of the law, uh, then then the prompt payment, the, the implementation part of the law says prompt payment for health care and health insurance benefits. It says health plan administrators shall reimburse a clean claim or any portion thereof submitted. Uh, by a healthcare provider that is eligible for payment and not contested uh, or denied not more than 45 days after receiving the clean claim. So the idea was that if you send in a bill, whether you're a doctor or a hospital, and the bill is considered clean, they review it, you know, maybe they've got to tweak it, they got to argue about this and that, but eventually they say we have a clean claim, which is a phrase in the law, we have a clean claim, and once it's agreed that it's a clean claim, the health plan administrator 
agrees to pay within 45 days. And I don't recall, and I don't see yet, as I, and I kind of go through this quickly, um, and remember back then there was no GRMC. Right. The, the thought that you would have a hospital, a provider like a hospital, not have a relationship with a health care insurance, you know, it's obviously possible. But back then, GMH had a relationship with everybody. Well, and and, and I'm trying to I, again. I, I'm I'm reading the trying to read through the bill uh, as as we're talking here too. So I, I you know I, I may have missed things since I wasn't going through a fine tooth comb. But it seems like the process that was laid out in this law uh, really speaks to a re- a direct relationship between a health plan administrator and a health care provider, I'm not seeing anything speaking to uh, directly a self-paid patient and a yeah, health care provider. That's how, I, that's how I read it as well uh, as I flip through it. And, and I don't recall us talking about it. wasn't like, I, I remember, this was really an attempt to make sure that providers and insurance companies were communicating clearly with each other yeah. to, to bill and then be paid. And with, with the assumption that, you know, you've got the innocent patient paying the insurance provider, to provide services, maybe with or without a deductible, right? And then they and services are provided by a healthcare provider, and the provider and the insurance company have a contract that says, "Here's how I will pay, I will be paid, or how you will be paid for your your services." So, what do you do with people that don't with, with providers and insurers that don't have a have a contract? What what do you do with those citizens? And and again, I'm not a lawyer. I, I would say my intention was not to uh, was not to say that if a self pay um, this law did not attempt to prescribe how a self-pay would handle a bill from a health care provider in terms of timely payment. Well, the, there, uh, there was also... This was, aimed at, this was aimed at health care providers and health care insurers, administrators, that have a contract. This guides how they, they shall uh, work with each other with a contract. But I can appreciate the legal question that both parties are having as to whether... Well, how does this how does it apply to patients? Now, there is a section called billing of patients allowed. Let's see, what does this say? No patient receiving care from healthcare provider may be billed for the same claim or portion thereof submitted to a health plan administrator. Okay, so again, even that language presumes that the health plan administrator has a contract with the healthcare provider. Yeah. That's why you don't send the bill to the patient. And, and the uh, Eric Plinsky from GRMC also noted in our in our interview with him this morning that in this specific instance. Claim is sort of a technical term that means uh, all of the hospital codings and all of that. And so the point is, if what the what is being said is a argued as a claim is supposed to be given to a patient, uh, a, a layman patient isn't going to be able to read what a hospital claim is to a healthcare provider. Or, I'm sorry, to a health plan administrator. Right. It's. I mean, we. Yeah. We, you're right. I mean, it's uh, us average citizens will find it difficult to, you know, assess the claim and was this the right charge? Was this the right service? That's usually why you go to ins- insurance company. I think that the tragic issue right now, though, is you've got. Uh, well, I don't know whether the, the health, the take care customer, presumes that they have that the take care has relationships with, you know, the providers and all providers. Uh, and, and you know, unfortunately, or fortunately, other providers can can actually turn away someone. I mean, most of the doctors on Guam don't do that. But it's not like you have thousands of people running to an ophthalmologist or to to get your physical, right? But you do have people come to the hospital, both the public and the private, and oftentimes come to the hospital in an emergency situation where you don't, you know, the provider side, both hospitals, they don't have the luxury of waiting around to say, gee, does this guy have coverage? Does he not have coverage? They're trying to just take care of the patient and right. at least stabilize them. But costs are incurred even when you just do that, right? And now, unfortunately, Take Care and, and GRMC are in this uh, this contest that is this, uh, where the, the to me the innocent person is sort is sort of the patient. Yeah. I mean, does the Take Care patient did they know at the time that that Take Care didn't have a contract with GRMC? Did they care? You know, if, if you're you're suffering. You just want to get to the closest hospital. I think that's the right thing to do. Well, and if you uh, wake up in a nice hospital room and uh, the question is, do you want to go to GMH now? I can also understand a natural inclination to say, I think I'm good here. Right, but I can appreciate take care. Again, maybe one reason. I mean, they they claim the reason they don't have a contract is they don't agree on the reimbursement to yeah. GRMC, mm-hmm. and they're claiming it's it's too high a reimbursement. Please go to the hospital. Now, I don't know what whether their customers know that. Uh, I don't know what the customers know from take care. When, you know, do, do the customers are they told that? 
not just GRMC, our customers told, here are all the providers that you can't go to or that you have to be self-pay. Mm-hmm. Right? I, I don't know. If, I don't know. Not just Patriot. I don't know if any insurance company. Heck, I don't. I haven't looked at my insurance well, policy well, in a while. I don't think I've ever gotten a list from an insurance company saying, "Here's the people that we don't we don't do business with, so don't don't go there, or else you're going to have to pay." Well, and again, uh, I, I don't have personal knowledge, but at least in today's uh, full page ad that you can find in both newspapers, uh, take care um, references uh, quote at the request of its employer groups. Uh, that they offered to extend coverage for services at GRMC via a benefit rider with a corresponding additional premium adjustment. In the end, Take Care's customers have decided to forego such GRMC coverage. So I, I don't know if that was uh, like a company wide uh, sort of notice, but th- they're at least purporting uh, that they did offer. If you want GRMC coverage, what do you think about tacking on this premium to your premium already, and uh, and that the idea was rejected? So it seems to me that at least there was some sort of attempt to uh, to educate uh, some of its subscribers on what they can and cannot do, and what uh, an additional you know this additional provider uh, network uh, addition would would cost. Uh, but just to go back to the historical context of it all, because I do find it a little bit interesting that uh, once again we sort of have the patients caught in the middle between this argument between a hospital and a health insurance provider, because I would think, especially back in 2001, uh, that was sort of a similar boat we found ourselves in. Uh, the hospital was blaming the insurance providers for not paying. The insurance providers were blaming the hospital for not paying or for not giving the information so they could they could look at claims. And in the middle, uh, we had patients who were sort of running the risk of maybe my health insurance won't be accepted at the hospital, or maybe the hospital will take the uh, maybe the my health insurance provider will take the hospital out of its uh, network provider. Well, provider I, network. I think really the intention back then was to try to help both sides. Prompt payment laws were being passed in the late 90s and 2000s all over the place, and we were just grabbing, jumping on that because it was sort of saying, look, if you're on the health care provider side, you got to get your act together. Get your billing together, document it, and send it in. You can't wait 7, 8, 9, 12 months and say, here's Simon's bill from 12 months ago. Please pay me. That's not fair to the insurance company. But then we also said insurance company, once they send you a bill and you look at it and it's clean, you got 45 days to pay it because, remember, you pay you you prepay for your health insurance, mm-hmm. right? Your payroll deduction now is paying is paying for next month's insurance. So you know insurance companies kind of get prepaid, and then wait for claims to come against their cash flow, and then they they pay the claim. So the intention was to get both the health care provider and the health care administrator slash health care insurer to improve their processes, work together, and clean up the billing so that one you could bill quickly, and two it could be reviewed quickly. And then paid quickly, and 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 this was really intended to guide that relationship. We we did not enter into the self-pay thing. We, you know, let's face it. Even today, as well as back in 1999 and 2000, GMH has people that self-pay that owes them 20, 30 million bucks. There's, yeah. there's no way we, our intention was to let GMH come in without any limitations. And now you can go after all these people. And and even if GMH wanted to go after all those people, and with the prescribed yeah, uh, and with the money, prescribed uh, interest and penalties that are in this law, if you don't pay within ninety days, I mean, I, I don't think it was your intention to saddle self-pay patients of GMH with the prescribed penalties that are in this law either. Um, but but now that I guess we we have a confirmation from you at least what you were intending, uh, I, I I think I I don't know if that's enough for take care to to back off or if they would want to assert this but i i'm just not sure in your thinking if this could require or maybe it would just be good governance to to clarify this in in legislation or if maybe we we're just going to have to litigate the matter well i i suspect the two parties will litigate because at at this point uh, they they refer to the law and the law that is currently in place that guides how providers and insurers do, do business with each other, right? And, of course, one of the argument is, well, what happens to those uh, providers and insurers that don't have a contractual relationship? And, and I would read this. To, to, the intention of the law at the time was we, we, this was about those that do have a relationship, not those that don't have a relationship. Okay. Uh, but it was between provider and administrator. I'm sure, uh, back then the thinking was hospitals and doctors and insurance companies 
versus a law to guide how self pays shall promptly pay a a service from a provider. Uh, so that I, but having said all of that, it doesn't really matter what I say to you on the radio. Litigators look at the letter of the law, and that's what they're going to have to argue over: is what did the law, what did what do the words say? I mean, it, even if they said, well, Simon said this on the radio, well, that that doesn't really matter what Simon says on the radio. What matters is what was the law that was passed by the legislature, signed into law by the governor, and what do those words mean? So. Uh, I'm not sure I solve anybody's problem, but but uh, I think I I suspect that this is going to go to down to some litigation. But if the question was was the intention of this guide self self paid and non insured, uh, I don't recall that that was our intention. This was really about guiding the relationship between a health plan. Uh, I'm sorry, a healthcare provider, hospital or doctor, and a health plan administrator or insurance company. No. that's pretty that's pretty clear in the, the preambles and, and the enabling. Part of the, the law. Okay, well, well, that satisfies me. I, I understand exactly what you're saying. That I won't be surprised if it's not satisfactory to uh, maybe the the party that doesn't agree uh, with at least what the letter of the law says, re- intentions regardless. Uh, since you were such uh, a, a good sport to come on and, and talk about something that happened 16, 17 years ago, Simon, <laughs> uh, if, if there's anything CCU related that you wanted to plug, maybe good news to share, I'd be happy to have you end the conversation with uh, not what you uh, used to be, but what you currently are. Well, absolutely. You know, I, I'm working on a piece, and, and I'll get it out to all of you shortly. But um, first off, happy Father's Day to all of all of the fathers of the world for playing the role that they play, and I hope they have a wonderful weekend and their family treats them good. Um, and, and then on the CCU side, one, one of the most proud, proudest things that are emerging from me is, you know, just a few weeks ago we awarded 120 megawatts of renewable energy, solar energy with battery storage, and with that addition and the solar energy we're going to add with the, the, the free Navy land we're getting. We're getting that land for free. I know some people thought we're paying for it. No, we pay nothing to the Navy for that property, but we get to put solar energy on that property, and all that energy goes into the grid. It doesn't go to the Navy. It goes to everybody on Guam so that we, they, we can all share the savings on the fuel side. But, but by 2021, we will now be installing 200 megawatts of renewable energy on Guam. This is the Guam Power Authority. This is the People's Power Company. It's going to uh, build, and, and we're going to use public-private partnerships, which have been very successful for us, and we're going to bring 200 megawatts of renewable energy on board by 2021. And, you know, we, nine years ago, and I think this is his anniversary month, Senator Ben and I got together, and we said, you know what, what should be our goal for the community? And we set up the law called the, the Renewable Portfolio Standard. And Ben said, you got to hit 25% renewable by 2035. Well, by 2021, we're going to hit the 25% 14 years early with the decisions we've made in the last uh, five months. So I hope Ben will be proud of that. that, that he'll probably say we still should have done it faster, Simon. But I, I hope he'll be proud to know that his, his ambition for us to use more renewable energy and burn less fuel uh, we were supposed to achieve this milestone by 2035. We're going to achieve it by 2021. And when we when we add these new generators that we're, we're still going to add, because renewable energy can't give you 24-7 every millisecond of the day. And, you know, everybody wants their power every second of the day. So we're still going to need to burn some fuel. But the new generators we're bringing in burn less fuel, and they burn a cleaner fuel. And when you add up the savings in fuel from the new generators, and the savings in fuel from the new solar generators and battery storage. The people of Guam will be burning 41% less fuel in 2021 than they do today. 41% reduction in the amount of fuel we use to create energy on Guam. That, that's going to be great for the pocketbook. That's going to be great for the environment. And that's a major milestone for the Guam Power Authority uh, and its professionals to be able to put our island in a position well, we're going to be burning 41% less fuel by 2021. Phil, you know that the fuel bill on your power bill is 50 to 80% of your bill. So if you really want to lower the power bill, you got to attack fuel. And we're attacking it with renewable energy and storage, and we're attacking it with new generation that uses less fuel and, and burns cleaner fuels, which is better for the environment. And by 2021, the people of Guam will own a power company, that is using 41% less fuel than we use today, that's going to bring everybody's power bill down. 
and we will be providing almost 25% of our power from renewables. And that's a major accomplishment. I, I, I've been working on a write-up to send out to you folks that, that I, I hope the people of Guam uh, will begin to appreciate that uh, we're well, the, the paradigm has shifted. Uh, we're implementing public law, and we're going to exceed the requirements of public law by 14 years, and we're going to double the fuel reduction that's in that power. Uh, he wanted us to knock off 20% by 2020. We're going to knock off 40% of fuel by 2020. And that's going to make a meaningful impact on everybody's life. Uh, in the next five years. Well, uh, that is, I, I think, breaking down the numbers that way, that we're accomplishing a, a benchmark that we set for ourselves faster uh, than we wanted to and that we're going to uh, actually be a lot more greener, or double the, the amount of uh, green energy that we wanted to produce by that time. Uh, so I, I think that is a very uh, good accomplishment that everyone should know about, 40% reduction of uh, fossil fuel, fuel use. Mm-hmm. Uh, that so, and, that, and that's going to lead to lower power bills, right? I mean, you know, renewables and storage are still, you know, they're not, they're not inexpensive, right? But our two bids now were six and eight cents a kilowatt hour. The LEAC, the oil portion of your bill, is 11 cents a, ki- a kilowatt hour. Yeah. So we have 120 megs of renewable energy coming online by 2018 that is cheaper than the cost of oil that we burn now. So, you know, that we're really positioned well, and, and I'm very proud of the professionals at GPA and what they've been able to develop and think through and assemble. And then the Navy's been great to work with. The PUC's been great to work with. It's been a very collaborative effort to implement Senator Ben's uh, uh, RPS law, the Renewable Portfolio Standard. In fact, we started talking about, okay, we've exceeded the standard. What's the new standard? How much more can we bring on to reduce our reliance on fuel? And that's the next battle. But, you know, give us these five years to implement. We've got to build all these things, and our contractor has to build all these things uh, and, and put them in place. But by 2021, the energy profile of Guam will be significantly different. And, and that's a, I'm very proud of, of what, the, what we've been able to achieve over there. Not to mention, on the waterworks side, we'll be done with the court order. We will have completed every project on the court order. And that will be done by 2021. So I'm looking forward to the end of this decade, trying to implement the changes that we have assembled uh, so that we can reward ourselves our, and our people with better service, lower energy costs, cleaner environment, a safer ocean, uh, and drinking water. And uh, that I think that's what we were elected to do. So that's Sa- what we're doing. Simon Sanchez of the Consolidated Commission on Utilities talking about some great things to look forward to and indulging us in rewinding the clock back in uh, what he used to be, a member of the Guam legislature. Thanks for the time, Simon. All right, Phil. Have a great weekend. And happy Father's Day. Thank you. Same to your your dad. Okay, Mm -hmm. great.